Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Much better. Um, just to explain, if, if I look a bit stiff when I'm moving around, it's because I am. Some of you will know that I dislocated my shoulder a few weeks ago, and uh, it's going to take about six months to recover. So um, uh, that's why I'm not shaking people's hands, by the way. It's not personal, it's just that it hurts. So, anyway, we're looking uh, this morning at a passage from 1 Peter. When I've been with you on Sunday mornings, we've been uh, looking at that, so you might like to turn to it. It's 1 Peter chapter, oh, it might even appear on the screen. We'll 1 to. Peter chapter yeah. 4, verses 7 to 19. We'll try to. Just to remind you that, that Peter wrote this letter to the churches in um, a part of what was then Asia, now a part of what is Turkey, encouraging the believers to stand firm in their faith. The context was that uh, in the society in which they were in, they were under pressure because of their love of Jesus. And last time, you may remember, or you might not, you might not have been here, or you might have forgotten, that we uh, looked at the passage beforehand, and we, we saw that we should stand firm in God because <laughs> Jesus died for us. Yep. Amen. 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 Jesus died for us. God is in control. Yes. Yes. Yep. Yes. All right, we'll, we'll start that from the beginning. So, um, a bit of response, you know, uh, would be really helpful here. So, we stand firm in God because Jesus died for us. Yes. yes. God is in control. Yes. yes. Evil powers, all of them are defeated. Yes. And all of us are going to face judgment. Yes. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> And we have eternal life. Yes. Amen. Yes. Verse 7, 1 Peter chapter 4. The end of the world is coming soon. Therefore, be earnest and disciplined in your prayers. Now, some of you might be old enough like me to remember when you'd go down the high street and you'd see a man with a a board up above his head, yeah, some of you remember this, and it said, the end of the world is nigh. Remember that? This verse, authorised version. So what does it mean to say, what does it mean for you, what does it mean for us, this is God's word, I'm not suggesting we should get billboards out by the way, and walk down Green High Street, and the end of the world is coming soon. What does it, what does it mean? What's the, I mean, Peter wrote this, getting on for 2,000 years ago. Was he wrong? What do you think? Oh, by the way, if you're, if you're here for the first time or, or you've not heard me preach before, I ask questions when I'm preaching, and some preachers ask questions, then tell you the answer. I ask questions, and you tell me the answer. <laughs> so... <coughs> Like he was um, speaking um, prophetically, that sort of like from God's perspective, um, from out of time, because God's out of time, mm -hmm. and that you know, once Jesus has come, there's sort of nothing new coming. Okay. Yeah. Very good. The yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I've always wondered if it's um, more sort of individually. That's the view I would take of it. So the end of the world is coming soon. Well, we all know that one certain thing in life is that you are going to die, but we don't know when. You know, Jesus said, "No one knows the time. No one knows um, except God." So in that respect, you don't know how long you've got left. So the end of your so, world is coming soon. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Potentially, yeah. 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 Oh, just just reading the passage, I think. Yeah. As a statement on its own, it's very interesting, but I think when you look at the next word, that gives it context. Mm -hmm. The other words come soon, therefore. Mm -hmm. There's like a call to action there as well, because yeah. time is precious kind of thing. Yeah. So that. We're going into the therefore in a lot of detail, okay. surely, okay. but it is understanding that context. Yeah, and I was just I was just thinking if you change the word the word world today, so 
to the end of the day is coming soon. It sort of like lends it more urgency. Mm, okay, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I'm just wondering where the end time is coming. So it's not just a man, just once, but it's from when he came. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The end, these are the end times. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So, let's, um, Jesus' resurrection, as several of you have said, brought in the end time. And I'm not going to do a whole piece on eschatology and all of that this morning, but brought in the final phase of history. We are in that final phase. Jesus' resurrection brought that final phase in. And we need to live with Jesus' return as our horizon. We need to live with Jesus' return as our horizon, what we are looking towards. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, let me read to you. You must not forget this one thing, dear friends. A day is like a thousand years to the Lord. And a thousand years is like a day. The Lord isn't really being slow about his promise, as some people think. No, he's being patient for your sake. He does not want anyone to be destroyed, but wants everyone to repent. The day of the Lord will come as unexpectedly as a thief. Then the heavens will pass away with a terrible noise. The very elements in themselves will disappear in fire. And the earth and everything on it will be found to deserve judgment. Since everything around us is going to be destroyed like this, what holy and godly lives you should live. <coughs> As Andy said, this is a therefore. In the light of this... The whole of the rest of the passage we're going to look at this morning is about how we need to live. In the context that we're in the end times. Jesus is coming back. The end of the world is coming soon. In that context, with his return as our horizon, how should we then live? That's what this passage is about. So that's what we're going to look at this morning. Is that okay? Yeah. <coughs> <laughs> So, the first thing is about our prayer life. Who prays? Okay, that's just about unanimous. One or two abstainers there. We <laughs> won't go around and ask why are one or two abstainers. But there we go. Um, our prayer, it says, needs to be earnest and disciplined. Which is the opposite to those things we looked at in verse 3 last time. We need to be earnest and disciplined. We need to be, in one writer, who I'm going to quote quite a lot this week, he writes on 1 Peter, one of my fav favourite writers on 1 Peter, a guy called Davids. He says this, This is about seeing life in the light of reality seen from God's perspective. Seeing life from God's perspective should shape the way that we pray. So we should pray earnest and disciplined prayer. So let's think about this for a minute. So praying in this context of being in the end times, the end of the world coming soon, Jesus coming back, earnest and disciplined. What does that mean about our prayer? How should that, do you think, be affecting your prayer, our, your prayer individually, our prayer corporately. How should that be affected, do you think? What does it mean? I've got a lot of questions today, by the way. Just, um, just warming up here. What does it mean? Yeah. Well, for me, if the end time is coming soon, we need to be earnestly praying for those that don't know about God. Absolutely, because time is running out. Yeah. So there's an urgency. Yeah. yeah. What else? You about to speak? 
okay. You just look like it. It's like you're preparing to say something. So. Discipline, does it mean um, it should be also sort of strategic? I can't pronounce the word. Something I'll say for Strategic. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. That's crazy. Happy to help. Cheers. <laughs> It should be focused, it should be disciplined, it shouldn't be just airy fairy somewhere. You should be people, things, situations, it should be. Yeah, it's the opposite of fluffy. Yeah, that's it. Because a lot of Christian prayer is that I hear in different contexts is fluffy. And this isn't this is earnest and disciplined, which is the opposite of fluffy. You were gonna say something. Well that word strategic because to remember that it's powerful. Mm -hmm. And what we pray makes a difference. Yeah. And it's a Can you say that again a bit louder? Because I'm not sure they heard that right over the back. <coughs> what did I say? It should be strategic. Yes. We, should, we should do it. Yes. Because it is powerful, it makes a difference, and we should be using it at increasing levels. Yeah. That's the thing about being disciplined. You see, it matters. How we pray, what we pray, it makes a difference in our world. Not just our personal little world, but in our world. You know, the thing that we live on, that goes around the sun, the whole thing is affected by our prayer. Because when you pray, you talk to the creator and sustainer of the entire universe. <coughs> He has power. And he listens. And your prayer, as Liz says, makes a difference. So in this context, our prayer needs to be earnest and disciplined. Verse 8. Most important of all, so your prayer needs to be earnest and disciplined. Most important of all, Continue to show deep love for each other, for love covers a multitude of sins. Most important of all, supremely important, is the fact that love should be the controlling factor in all of our relationships in the church. The word deep here literally means at full stretch. Now, remember that biblical love, as you've heard me say many times, is not about being warm and fuzzy. God so loved the world did not mean that God sat in heaven, looked at our world and felt warm and fuzzy about it. Frankly, I doubt it. He looked at it and thought, this needs a saviour, I'm going to send my son Jesus. That isn't warm fuzzy, that is about giving of self for others. That's what Christian love is about. It's about the giving of self to enrich the life of others. That's at the heart and centre of the gospel, the heart and centre of our Christian life. Wanting the best for others, even when it's difficult. See, selfish love is wanting the best for others when it makes me feel good, or does something good for me. Christian love is about wanting the best for others because it's the best for others. Even when it's difficult, <coughs> even when it's costly, even when it's hard. And this phrase about love covering is about not allowing other people's actions, other people's words, to cause rifts in relationships. You know, I, I am, I continue to be, I mean, I'm, as you know, I'm relatively old now, not as old as some of you, but I continue still to be staggered when I talk to people. I was talking to someone the other day, and uh, we were talking about family. And... Uh, you know, they would be slightly careful here, don't want to identify this person. So they were talking about their family, and um, most of their family they don't talk to anymore. Because of this that happened here, or that that happened there. 
I, I find it so often when I'm talking with people that relationships are broken down and people, you know, I've visited people and you know, they, they've not talked to their parents for 20 years or parents that, I remember talking to this lady lived down the road here, she's died now, and she was on her own. Turns out that she's got brothers and sisters who live in the area she's not talked to for 20 years. What is that about? And sometimes, brothers and sisters, we find that in church. <gasps> Between Christians. <gasps> Our love, God's love, should cover and enable the maintenance of loving relationships. Now that doesn't mean that we ignore sin. Sin needs to be dealt with. But it's about not responding in kind. When I sit and talk to people, why haven't you talked to your brother for the last 20 years? Well, he said to me, and so I said to him, and so we've not talked since. Love covers a multitude of things. I remember preaching on a similar passage to this here in Green for some years ago, and the guy said to me afterwards, he said, uh, I, I feel God's spoken to me this morning. He said, I'm, I'm going to go and visit my mother. I've not talked to her for ten years. So we did. They were reunited. And that told me the following way. So it may well be, just in passing here, that there may be some relationships, maybe with Christian brothers and sisters, maybe in family, where you need to allow God's love to cover something. We believe in a God of reconciliation, amen? amen. Reconciliation between us and God, but also reconciliation between human beings. That's God's heart. Satan's heart is to break relationships. Undermine relationships. God's heart is to maintain, is to build. So, I think there'll be an opportunity for prayer later on. I think there will be. And it may well be that you might need some prayer for the restoration of a relationship. Recovering of love. Cheerfully. Verse 9. Share your home with those who need a meal or a place to stay. Remember, all of this is in the light of the fact that the end is coming soon. Pray, love, give hospitality. Now, in this context, in this society, giving hospitality, these brothers and sisters here were being asked to do something really difficult, far more difficult than it is for you. More difficult for two reasons. One, they were desperately poor. Sharing when you've not got is more costly than sharing when your cupboard and freezer stacked. It is my observation as I've travelled around the world, by the way, <coughs> that the poorer people are, the more generous they are. Just notice that in passing. Because they know what it's like to receive generosity. So their hearts are far more open. I'm thinking, just in my mind here, thinking of visiting a, a shelter in an informal settlement. It was made of um, bits of packing case that had come from the Nissan car plant a few miles away. And uh, it was probably about the size of this part of this room. And there were 12 adults who lived in that space. One of them had a part-time job as a cleaner in a nearby city. No one else had any employment. They'd never met me before. They welcomed me in. Sat me down on the chair. Made me a drink. They wanted to share with me. They wanted nothing from me. They didn't know who I was or even what I was doing there. 
They were Christians, every one of them. Hospitality, sharing. The second reason why hospitality was very different, difficult for them, was because in their society, as we've already seen, there was hostility to Christians. So the more prominent you were as the Christian, the more you attracted hostility. Get that? Mm. So if you're welcoming people into your home, that makes you look a bit more significant as a Christian. Yeah? So this attracts even more hostility from your neighbours, from the community in which you're set. But hospitality is a gospel value. Old Testament, New Testament. It's a God <coughs> value. The church <coughs> is to be, quoting a guy called Job's, the church is to be that alternative society where Christians find a place when shunned by unbelievers. A place where common beliefs unite more than differences divide. So, Greenford, Northolt, Southolt, wherever it is you live, 2019. What does practicing hospitality <coughs> look like for us today? What should it look like for us today? Or Sudbury, or wherever it is, Wembley, wherever you live. What should it look like for us? I mean, our context is a very different context to the place as it was where Peter lived, wrote to. But God's word is still as relevant today, amen? Yes. So what does it mean for us? What does it mean for you? Um, giving to that person you know, we meet on the road who is asking for something, uh, being helpful to the poor lady that is uh, trying to cast her, uh, to share on the radio station. Okay, so it's looking out for people in need around us and actually giving towards that person of our, of our time yeah. and of our resources. our resources. Okay, what else? Yeah. Um, uh, reading that there, talking about love and loving people without walls. So that loving someone or loving people without expecting anything from them. Mm -hmm. Also, I think it means to go and mend a few fences. What do you mean by that? Mending a few fences, meaning that people you've not spoken to, like you were saying, not spoken to for a long time, because something happened a long time ago that you just can't sort of let go of. But God's saying to us, look, let go of that and go and present yourself. Mm -hmm. Listen without saying, but well, hang on a minute, I want to... I want to bring this up now, hang on, you did this. And, mm -hmm. No, just listen. Because mm -hmm. there may be a side of a story that you don't know about that you need to hear. Mm -hmm. You to probably mend that fence. And when we present ourselves, it shouldn't be with long arms. No. Do you know that expression? Open arms. Some of you know that expression? Uh, long arms, um, yeah. English expression, empty hands. Yes. Other cultures express same expression, long arms. Yeah. I think it also means that you can help the homeless regardless of what they are, what they've done. It doesn't matter if they're alcoholics or druggies or whatever. If you can open your heart to them, if they can see something in you, you know, that's love. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, sharing God's love. Regardless of what they are. Mm. Thank you. I hear that. I just want to say also that some people are homeless and they've not done anything wrong. Yeah. Mm. There are people who are homeless as a direct result of their own actions. I get that. But there are people also who are homeless in our society today in the UK to our shame as a society who are homeless who've done absolutely nothing wrong. The system has done them wrong. Yes. So yeah. check that in as well. <coughs> so I was going to say, um, for me, then those who need a meal not necessarily needing food but needing your time mm -hmm. and sometimes that's within the community of our own church mm -hmm. so it's 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 looking after one another as well mm -hmm. and providing and and being that person that friend that somebody that we maybe needs to just talk or whatever mm -hmm. of having that that sort of time and then in turn people outside of church see that and want to know more what that yeah. looks like mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. yeah
I, I think one of the key things for hospitality in our culture today is the giving of time. You know, we, we live in a generally fairly affluent culture, but what people are really short of is actually time. So it's more costly, actually, to give time to somebody than it is to give them 10 quid. So that's part of hospitality in our, in our culture. Let's move on. Verse 10. God has given each of you. Who's here this morning? Put your hand up if you're here. Yeah. If you're not here, put your hand up. Okay. So who does this apply to? Uh, put your hand up if it applies to you. Okay. God has given each of you a gift. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Do you have the gift of speaking? Then speak as though God himself was speaking through you. Do you have the gift of helping others? Do it with all the strength and energy that God supplies. Then everything you do will bring glory to God through Jesus Christ. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Amen. Stick that alongside 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 7. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Can we say that together? A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. The person next to you. A spiritual gift is given to each of us so we can help each other. Who does that apply to? Oh. Any exceptions? No. Interesting. Use them well to serve each other. Now speaking is a serious business. You will, you will know, and I'm sure Warren knows this, and Timmy, and Carly, and anybody else that preaches, that those that stand at the front and speak have a stricter judgment by God, the Bible tells us. Speaking's a serious, yeah, you like that, don't you? I'm really pleased about that. Speaking is a serious business, because we're communicating... From God. Charles, can I, can I use the fact that you're a diplomat for a moment in this, in this, in this illustration? Is that okay? Go ahead, David. Thank you. <laughs> Charles is a diplomat. So when Charles is at work and he talks to someone from another country, he's not speaking on behalf of Charles. In fact, they really don't care what Charles thinks. That's not why they're talking to Charles. What they want to know is Charles' government that he serves. What is it that they're saying? So when Charles speaks, it's not Charles at work. It is the government that he represents that's speaking. Do you get that? Is that fair? Yeah. Now you serve a government, don't you? The kingdom of God. So when you speak... On whose behalf are you speaking? God. God. Mm -hmm. Serious business. Mm -hmm. If Charles goes off peace, and I'm sure he's never ever done this, <laughs> and he's never going to. <laughs> Charles is speaking to somebody from some other government, and he goes rogue, <laughs> and says some outrageous things. <laughs> who's dishonoured? The government. When you go off piste and go rogue and say some things not authorised by God, who is dishonoured? It's a serious business, speaking on God's behalf. It doesn't just apply to preachers, it applies to all of us because we are representatives of the kingdom of God. We are the hands, the feet, the mouths of Jesus, of God, into our generation. Mm -hmm. 
Serious business. Helping people. Serious business also. It covers everything that we do for people. I, I, I like this quote here I've got. Again, it's from this guy called David's. See, God gives us everything that we need to do what he asks us to do, yes? Yes. yes. God gives us everything we need to do the things he asks us to do, yes? Yes. yes. I like this. God has ordered the job done. God will pay the expenses, be they material, physical or emotional. Yes, that's a good way. And it's all in his strength, which means that all the glory goes to God. God. Verse 12. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you're going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad. For these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it's revealed to all the world. So be happy when you are insulted for being a Christian. Did you hear that? Be happy when you're insulted for being a Christian for then the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. You know... We shouldn't be hugely surprised when we suffer unjustly. Because we're Christians. Uh, the word Christian literally means little Christ. It's the diminutive. Little Christ. Christ suffered unjustly. So if we suffer unjustly, where's the surprise in that? When hard times come, people sometimes ask the question, where's God? I've noticed this tendency. <laughs> However, I mean, they ask the question also, what have I done to deserve this? Yeah, being born is the answer to that one. Now these people, remember, they were in a cultural context where they stood out as Christians because they wouldn't take part in many of the normal social activities that formed a part of their society. Because they involved practices that were abhorrent to Christians that were involved in the worship of idols and so-called gods. And they're told to be happy. Not to be happy because having a hard time is fun. Who here thinks having a hard time is fun? <laughs> but we're happy because... Not because it's enjoyable, because it actually marks us out as belonging to God. It's a sign that God's Holy Spirit is at work in your life. <coughs> you know, we, we like to think that we enjoy the fact that we feel warm and fuzzy because God's with us. We also should enjoy it when the fact that God's with us is shown up because life is a bit difficult. Probably slightly stronger evidence. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, Prying into other people's affairs. It is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. For the time has come for judgment and it must begin with God's household. And if judgment begins with us, what terrible fate awaits those who have never <coughs> obeyed God's good news. <coughs> I, I talk to people, Christians, sometimes who seem to think that it's a very strange thing that Christians get judged. I don't know quite what Bible they've been reading, but it, it doesn't seem to be the one that I know quite well. Because actually, everyone, human being, is going to be judged for how they live their lives. No exceptions.
Some find it a bit strange to think that God's judgment starts with his own people. It does seem to be a pattern I observe throughout the whole of the Bible, just interestingly. It's with God's people that God starts. Because they're the people, after all, who are actually saying that they followed him. So it seems a, a logical place to start with judgment, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. There is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus. Let's hear that. There is no condemnation for those who put their faith in God. There is no condemnation for those who put their faith in God. But there is still judgment. And we've talked about that previously. So I'm just going to rest that there and go on to the final verse for this morning. So if you are suffering in a manner that pleases God, keep on doing what is right. Trust your lives to the God who created you. For he will never fail you. Suffering does not mean that God's not in control. Difficult things coming into your life does not mean that God is not in control. When your life is tough, it does not mean that God doesn't care about you. It's in those circumstances that we must continue to do good. Clowney writing on this passage, he, he said this. This is people in lots of parts of the world, they know this as being absolutely true. But those of us who live in the West, uh, we don't know this. We might know it with our heads. They know it in their lives. He says this. Opposition and suffering open new doors of opportunity to show the love of Christ. Many of our brothers and sisters, in much of our world, that's their normal experience. It's not our normal experience here in the UK. <coughs> but it's true, nonetheless. So, let's just pull together five things to take away from this morning. As I ready to hand back to... Pastor Warren. Firstly, we need to live with Jesus' return as our horizon. Our horizon I means that's what we look towards. That frames our life. It frames our existence. We need to view life, secondly, from God's perspective. Not our own. Thirdly, we need to love at full stretch. Fourthly, every one of us has received gifts from God. We need to use them to serve others. And finally, <coughs> we shouldn't be surprised when we suffer unjustly. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.